right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second one of Toronto Virtual, Virtual Leaders Lab. We're excited to kick, to kick off the next three days with an exciting roster of presentations to help you start and facilitate successful one up school chapters. My name is Maya, and I'm the president of One Up Toronto, and I'll be joined today by my co facilitator, Lucy, who is the director of finance at One Up Toronto. Please don't hesitate to ask either of us any questions in the chat box during this event. Before we begin, we encourage all participants to have their video enabled. We will be recording this event. Please also ask us any questions using the chat feature as you'll be muted during our speaker presentations. Closed captioning is available with the button at the bottom. And lastly, feel free to tag us at one Toronto on Instagram or using hashtag one up leaders lab for any social media posts over the next three days. Now, I want to start off today with a short land acknowledgement. As we gather for this meeting physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in doing so recognize the various traditional lands on which urban minds is based. Toronto is the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, European and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We encourage everyone here to embody the spirit throughout our sessions. Now, for those of you who are attending Leaders Lab for the first time and are not really sure what this is all about, let me offer a quick explanation. So Leaders Lab is a free virtual three-day leadership training program for high school students. This program features multiple guest speakers and workshops that will help you build a diverse and practical skill set. Our goal is to prepare you not only as an active citizen pushing for change in your community, but also as a one-up school chapter leader when school resumes. Here's a quick video about one-up and Leaders Lab. first experience with one Up was actually their first summer program. For six weeks, we got to design and build our own project, which we got to have in public and have real people give us feedback and use our projects. I went to the Weird Club last year in 2018, and I found Design Jam to be quite fun. I really wanted to become an executive and then the president of um, one up because I felt that it would give me the opportunity not only to be a part of something of urban design but also to bring that experience and bring those opportunities to other people my age. After um, meeting the people from the Leaders Lab, I thought that um, One Up Toronto was a great um, organization to be a part of, so that kind of pushed me to join the exec team this year. So at first I thought, oh, it was just a summer program and I could volunteer and I could help out with other people. But then I came to realize it was actually bringing good experiences to other people. And it was really helping educate other people on why it's important for youth to take part in their cities and to be involved in the design. All right, so on today's agenda, we will introduce one up and the urban minds teams and do a fun icebreaker activity. Then this will be followed by speaker introductions, a presentation from a student member of our one up York Mills chapter, an introduction to urban planning by the co founder of urban minds and a leadership skills presentation by the youth led grassroots organization light. We will conclude today with a wrap up and a Q&A session. This event is run by One Up Toronto, a youth-led organization dedicated to empowering high school students in underrepresented fields 
like urban planning and city building. Here's a picture of this year's one up executive te team of high school students, starting with our president for this year, which is me. Then we have our director of engagement, Emily, our director of design, Lucy, followed by Vincent, our director of public relations. And last but not least, we have um, Lulu as director of finance and Jessica as our director of technology. One Up is powered by Urban Minds, which is a nonprofit organization with a mission to create meaningful ways for youth to shape equitable and sustainable cities. Since 2017, Urban Minds has been running the One Up program with the goal to inspire and equip youth to become change makers in the community and in their communities. Here's a picture of our current Urban Minds team. Ryan and Angela are our co founders. Our three OneUp program coordinators are Reed, Danelle, and Jennifer, who help the OneUp exec team to organize events like Leaders Lab throughout the year. Enosh and Eric are our outreach coordinators who help promote our initiatives on social media, newsletters, and blog posts, as well as running our Discord server. Selena is also an outreach coordinator for the team. Our project coordinators, Brianne and Jane, help clients such as municipalities with youth engagement in their projects. Our growth coordinators, Matthew and Adriana, help build the OneUp network. Federico is, a, is an urban planning master's student who has been with us this summer to complete his internship as a research analyst. That's the Urban Minds team. We'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our generous sponsors for their contribution. OneUp Leaders Lab, amongst many of our other initiatives, would not be possible without their support. At our top, at the top, our diamond sponsors this year is the IBI Group. Next, our platinum sponsor is SBN Architects and Planners. Our gold sponsor this year, our gold sponsors this year are GSP Group, Janet Rosenberg Studio, PFS Studio, GH3, Urban Strategies, MJMA, Core Architects, Perkins and Will, and 880 Cities. Our goals for today include learning about the basics of urban planning one up school chapter experiences and leadership skills. Now for a fun icebreaker activity. This activity is called Zoomed In, where I'll be showing a zoomed in version of a photo first, and everyone can take guesses from the audience about what the object could be. Please leave your guesses in the chat box. I will then reveal what the actual object is. So let's start with this one. What could this object be? Please leave your, ob your object guesses in the chat box. I see one that says trash can. It's not a trash can. What other guesses could we have? Mailbox? Mm, nothing yet. It does sort of look like a mailbox. I see that. <laughs> All right, maybe this one's. It does sort of look like Wonderland rides too, because it's made of metal. All right, let's reveal this one. So the answer is, this one is a whistle. I felt like the mailbox and the trash can were sort of close, but maybe that's just me. Okay, next one. What could this mysterious green object be? I'll give everyone 20 seconds. Hopefully this one's easier. Venus flytrap does kind of look like a plant. I'll give you a hint though, it isn't a plant. Oh, we're getting close with the insect guesses. I think we're very close, yep. This is, oh, I'm not sure if it's showing up, but we, I think Daniel got it. All right, let's do another one. What could be in this picture? I think this one's a little bit easier as well. <laughs> yep, I see like three lipsticks and we got it, it's right. That's right. Okay, now this one's a bit harder to make up for that last one. What could this strange object be? Kind of looks like a tree bark to me. Oh. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> Everyone was able to guess that one really fast. I couldn't do it my first time around. Yep, it's a peanut. Okay, and I think this is, this might be our last one. So any guesses on what this could be? 
paint palette. Nope. I think this one's really, really zoomed in. <laughs> With ice cream. Oh, I think someone actually got it. It is actually a golf ball. <laughs> wow, I didn't think you guys would guess that one. That was a tough one. All right, so thanks so much for participating in that icebreaker. I, I personally thought a lot of those were really challenging. Um, and now I think we're ready to meet today's speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Ryan Lowe, who is one of our co-founders of Urban Minds. Ryan is an urban planner, community engagement practitioner, and youth advocate. At Urban Minds, he bridges the gap between youth and decision makers by developing youth engagement strategies with municipalities and community partners. Ryan has extensive experience in facilitating engagement events for placemaking and transportation projects across Canada and the US. Our next speaker will be Emilio, um, who is a student member of our One Up York Mills chapter. The York Mills chapter has been super busy and active even during the pandemic, and we are excited to hear about what they've been up to, as well as how, as well as how they successfully run a school chapter. Our third and final speaker today is Caitlin from Light. Caitlin is an incoming third year student stud studying global health and pathobiology at the University of Toronto. She currently serves as the executive director of Light, a grassroots nonprofit organization centered around youth led community initiatives. In response to COVID-19, Caitlin co-founded Young Ontarians United, which is a research initiative which seeks to amplify youth voices and analyze intersectional cha challenges posed by the pandemic in order to advocate for equitable solutions. Furthermore, Caitlin is a member of Senator McFadden's Canadian Council of Young Feminists, where she's advocating for lowering the voting age to 16 through the Vote 16 steering community. Caitlin also coaches debate and endeavors to instill empathy and self-confidence in youths. She has received recognition for her social innovations at the, at the Canada Wide Science Fair. Now that I've just introduced our speakers, I will be handing over the mic to our first speaker, Ryan from Urban Minds, to give us a more in-depth look at the world of urban planning. So take it away, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. I'm just going to share my screen here. All right. And so thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Maya. Um, again, my name is Ryan Lowe. I'm the co-founder of Urban Minds. And today I've been asked to give a very quick introduction to the wonderful world of urban planning. Uh, and I very unoriginally titled this as Urban Planning 101, but I hope you enjoy what I'm going to share with you today. So let's start off with this amazing picture of myself. Uh, when you think of the term urban planning, you think about planning the future, right? Well, you can't really think about the future without thinking about the past. So I thought it'd be interesting to pull up a picture of me from just over 10 years ago when I was in high school to tell you how I got from there to where I am today. So uh, as a kid growing up in Hong Kong, I was fascinated by all the buildings and skyscrapers around me. And, and you might have guessed, I played a lot of SimCity as well as a kid, and video games graphics have come a long way since then. And when I was in grade 12, I was uh, accepted into architecture school. I was so excited because that was my lifelong dream. Well, lifelong for a 17 year old anyway. And without going too much into the, the details, I realized that designing walls and staircases might not have been what I truly wanted to do. And full credit to those like Angela, architects who do work in the field, but I ended up studying geography in Waterloo and taking courses in urban planning and environmental studies. And four years later, I decided to go to grad school at McGill to study urban planning. And after all, that childhood passion for cities never really go away, went away. Now, I'm not only the co-founder of Urban Minds, <clears throat> my day job is with the city of Toronto where I organize public events, <clears throat> consultation processes for many transportation projects. So now that you've heard a little bit about my backstory, you might still be wondering, 
what is urban planning? This question continues to haunt me to this day with all the new people I meet who aren't in the field. So maybe in the chat, you can quickly tell me just yes or no, um, whether you uh, whether you think you know what urban planning is. You can just type yes or type no. <clears throat> Probably not. Seeing a yes from Maya, but you're kind of biased. <laughs> um, okay, okay. I'm seeing some no's. Arish is kind of, you work, <laughs> you work in the field. <laughs> okay, now, um, all right, let's move on and see what this might mean. <laughs> so somehow not a lot of you seem to know what an urban planner does or what urban planning is. And actually planners themselves have a hard time explaining what urban planning is. And I certainly have a hard time explaining what I do to my mom. So that's, there's that for you. Um, and that's because most of us never learned much about it in elementary school or in high school. The closest you'd get to it would be uh, from geography or civics class. And yes, you might have heard about things like land uses and how you shouldn't mix residential uses with industrial uses, but there's so much more to it. Unless you live on a remote island in the middle of nowhere, chances are urban planning touches almost every single aspect of your life. Where you live, learn, and play are all influenced by decisions that city planners make. So today, more than half the world's population live in urban areas and more than 80% of Canadians live in cities and towns. And those numbers continue to climb year after year. And even big tech com companies like Google, Amazon, and even Facebook, they all want to get into this city building game because that's where all the people are. And so our jobs as planners are more important than ever before. And okay, just to give it to you straight, this is my go-to definition uh, for urban planning. It's short and sweet. It's about managing our resources, whether that's land, roads, services, or people, managing our resources to improve our quality of life. Now, at the risk of scaring you all away, this is what all planners in Ontario need to be familiar about. Um, planning is a political process, and there are many pieces of legislations and policies that govern how planning should be done in Ontario, but one of the most important tools is the official plan, which is highlighted here in the red uh, rectangle, um, the official plan of each municipality, a fancy term for a, a city or a town. And uh, the official plan guides where we live, work, study, and play. Um, it also guides where or how we move, whether you walk, bike, take transit, or drive. Um, it also protects our way of life through policies about the economy and jobs, about the environment and climate change, and very important these days, public health. And so the official plan guides how our city should grow and improve. And who are the players involved? So first you've got the province, and in our case, Ontario. And depending on where you live, for example, if you live in Mississauga, you have a two-tiered municipal government. There's the upper tier regional government, which is Peel region. And there's the lower tier municipal government, which is the city of Mississauga itself. Now, their next door neighbor, Toronto, uh, they are a single tiered municipality. Now, no matter how many tiers there are, um, there are quite a few people, um, we call them stakeholders, involved in creating and updating and reviewing an official plan. There is city council, so think of uh, your mayor and your city councillors. There are also land use planners, um, people who own land and develop land and their consultants, so architects, engineers, etc. And of course, residents like yourself, 
who give feedback and input on how the official plan should be shaped. And so aside from official plans, planners also use these crazy color-coded maps you see here to differentiate or designate different land uses, and we call that zoning. And besides land use, there are also planners who focus on transportation, how to move people and goods around uh, and across to different places efficiently. And still, there are others who focus on the environment, on environmental planning. And they look at how we should protect our watersheds and natural habitats. And at a slightly smaller scale, planners look at how big, how tall, how dense our buildings should be and where they should be placed. Now, I've, what I've described to you so far is they, they all involve big plans, big moves, big projects from a very top-down approach, uh, very driven by the government. Now, that is only one side of the coin. What fascinates me more, and hopefully what would intrigue you, would be the bottom-up approach of building our cities. Now, what do I mean here? Um, as an example, let's think about public spaces. What is a public space? Um, can anyone maybe in the chat uh, venture a guess of, you know, how would you describe a public space? How would you define it? What would you describe it? Jennifer says accessible, open for all, promotes engagement. Okay. How would you describe to your mom? or your dad, or your sibling, what a public space is. I see here um, areas where the general public can access to do whatever, a place that caters to the needs of a big population, all areas outside the front door, area people can engage with one another. These are all good answers. And to me, it's really spaces outside of our homes, outside of workplaces, places that we all share. Um, so why does it matter? And I wanna show you a few examples. You know, a public space can be a park, a square, a street, or even the waterfront if we all have access to it. But there are also, these are also public spaces. They can be dangerous, scary, dirty, empty, in the middle of nowhere. And poorly designed public spaces drive people away, but good ones, they bring people together. And they help build communities. So that, yeah, as a lot of you said in the chat, it is about um, where people could gather, where people could interact with each other. And in contrast to the big plans and big things I mentioned earlier, these things don't need to be, you know, they don't need to be big projects or big plans or big moves. These could be as small as, this could be something as small as taking over a couple of parking spots on the street and turning it into a mini park. It could be about painting a small section of your street to make it safer and more welcoming for people who walk across the street. This is a project um, that I actually got to play a very small part in. And over just a few days, um, volunteers painted a temporary bike lane on a short section of Danforth Avenue in downtown Toronto. And it made it a lot safer for people who want to ride bikes there. And then there are other groups and organizations who've turned uh, vacant lots of land into community gardens to grow food for those who are in need. And some people have transformed rooftops, for example, into gardens and even built these really cool pollinators to attract bees and butterflies and help them thrive. What about parking lots? Uh, I think some of you might be living in the suburbs and you see a lot of these kinds of plazas. Um, so a group of people decided to create a, a wonderful patio space uh, in, in a parking lot uh, at, a, at a plaza or a strip mall in Scarborough. And the best thing about it is that you don't have to pay a single dime or cent to, uh, 
use it. You don't have to buy anything you to pay for water or whatever to get in. There's even a small stage for artists to perform to the community. Now, I'm showing you all these examples because, yep, that's Lawrence and Warden, that's right. Yeah, I'm showing you all these examples because I want to show you that urban planning isn't just about the big plans and grandiose you know, designs. It can also start with small projects by ordinary people of all ages. So this is where you come in. What's your place in all of this? After a whole year of COVID, we've revamped our one-up program so that the focus is on building you up as city builders. And the Leaders Lab this week is only the beginning. As a participant, a uh, one-up fellow, that's what we will call you from here on, you will learn more about city building from other experts uh, these three days and our webinars throughout the fall. And you and your friends will get to learn more about your own community through activities we designed for you. And we'll talk more about how to run a school chapter and recruit people more a bit later. But you'll learn, uh, most importantly, how to mobilize your peers for a cause. And what's learning without doing? You will get to apply what you've learned through a design project and more specifically through a design competition. And again, our 1UP team will share more details with you in the near future. So 1UP fellows, I'm super excited for what's in store ahead of you. And I'm looking forward to our journey together this year. I hope you learn lots and have lots of fun these three days with us. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Ryan. All right, mm -hmm. I'll give everyone a second to maybe drop some questions in the chat, and then we'll keep going. So yeah, you can type your question in the chat or you could just unmute. I think I heard someone there. Or not. <laughs> what has been your favorite project that you've done either with Urban Minds or the city of Toronto so far? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Okay, one of my favorite projects um, was actually with the city of Markham, um, where we were helping them with their strategic plan. So as a big corporate body, they have to, they, they create these strategic plans every four years. And what they've asked us to do is to talk to youth, talk to young people who live, uh, study, and uh, hang out in Markham um, to ask them what their thoughts are uh, about the strategic plan. So we ended up going to shopping malls and to youth events, and we had a trivia spinning wheel set up, and we had people answering trivia questions, and then we give them a timbit. And with the toothpick that they um, ate the Timbit from, they could use it to vote for um, their top priority. And so it combines fun and food, two of my favorite things. Um, and yeah, I hope we could, yeah, I hope we will be able to do something like that soon. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for the question. Um, I'm going to answer, is it, um, Bilal, I don't know if I'm uh, pronouncing your name right. Um, please correct me if I'm not. Uh, what is a pressing urban planning issue in Toronto you think needs more exposure? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, I think a very pressing issue in Toronto is um, the crisis of housing affordability. And that's something that I know um, I know I didn't think much about it when I was in high school, but as you um, get older and start thinking about um, your life after high school, 
um, and where you may live, um, things get to become very challenging in terms of you know, affordability. And so I think that's something, a conversation that we need to have with young people about um, solutions to make housing more affordable and um, accessible to people who you know, may not go on to university or college. Um, people who want to move out sooner than most people um, from their families for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I think that is a very challenging, complex issue in Toronto that needs more exposure, especially to a, a younger generation. Um, I'm going to, Arish, sorry, I'm just going to answer Math Matthew's question first. What are potential gray areas in engaging the public while adhering to the political agenda? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> it's a very fine balance um, to, to, to um, at play here. I think you want to be able to make things happen um, and you do rely on um, politicians or political forces to help you achieve certain objectives. But you, I think there is a fine balance of trying to win or trying to get buy-in from both the public and the polit political actors to achieve the things that will improve people's lives. And so I think the gray area is trying to find, I guess, the ways you go about finding common ground. Um, and sometimes that involves um, being very tac tactful <laughs> um, about how you present your message to either politicians or to the public, um, just so that they understand why you're um, asking for feedback on certain topics. I know it's a very broad answer, um, but it is very tricky. Do we have time for one more question, Maya? How much time do we have? Three minutes. All right, keep those questions coming. I'm going to answer Arija's question now. Um, how do you think the pandemic has changed our perception of public spaces? Um, I think there are two things. One, people appreciate outdoor spaces a lot more because of the pandemic. I think people appreciate parks, appreciate green spaces a lot more, and people are starting to rediscover places that they haven't necessarily been to for a long time or haven't even discovered in the past um, and using them just for walks or to hang out with friends. Um, I think before COVID, um, once in the you know blue moon where people would ask to go on a picnic, but now it's like every hangout is a picnic. So it's um, that's really that's changed how we see public spaces. Um, and I think the second thing would be about um, how we could make sure that these public spaces are really serving our needs. So um, on one of those picnics, I really needed to go to the bathroom. And unfortunately, it was like a dinner picnic. So by the time I wanted to go or needed to go, the bathroom was already closed. Um, and that is not a pretty situation. <laughs> so yeah, I think just thinking about the amenities, about the, the things that uh, cater to basic needs, um, in our public spaces, um, we need to put in planners and decision makers need to put in more thought um, about those things. I eventually held it in and went home, just so you guys know. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, Ryan, for answering all of our questions. Um, next, we would like to welcome Emiliano, who will talk about his experience with the York Mills School Chapter. So over to you. Hi, uh, do you hear me? 
Uh, uh, let me just pull up the slides actually again. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so uh, it's, hi. So my name is uh, Emiliano. Uh, I've been at the one up at the York Mills chapter for a year now, and like it's been pretty fun. But because of COVID, of course, it wasn't the same as last year. I got to watch the one up, I the one up chapter at my school do like uh, like a lot of fun stuff last year. So I decided to join him this year, and uh, I must say it was still very enjoyable. Like, and yeah. So when it came to recruiting members, originally last year we have a club fest at our school, and what what happened is uh, the president of uh, our chapter, Doris, who would be here normally, uh, was would uh, sit at our in the in the club fest and uh, be prepared to answer many questions. There, we had like small posters like here for joining a writing, the writing team, the photography team and the design team and such. Uh, for this year, we, you, there was really no option to do it in school. So we have our own platform uh, for on social media or Instagram, I mean, and which we promoted uh, the club from our stories and posts and such. There's like an example of one of our posts over there. And we put a form, like a Google form on our, in the, on our bio for the, the page in which uh, students were able to go on and, and, and fill it out to, if they wanted to be part of the club. When it came to creating content this year, since our original plan was to work on renovating our school library, but we couldn't do that, uh, we decided to educate uh, the rest of the students at our school on urban planning. So we decided to make multiple educational posts, two per week, in which members of our club uh, decide, uh, research a topic on urban planning on urban or urban design and summarized it into a post. Uh, some of our examples were famous people related to urban planning, careers for it, and everything you see there, many more. We've had like multiple dozen posts on it on our page. Uh, these are, uh, we, uh, this is what we were made plan. These were the, what we were instructed to do some of our tasks. We also did many other tasks such as uh, creating uh, quizzes for, on our stories from our posts so that people can answer them, test their knowledge on urban planning and stuff. When it came to promoting the club, that's where I mainly stepped in on. Uh, I created posts for like small activities that our club was able to host, such as uh, a game of Among Us one time. I think it was during a long weekend. We we did that, and we had like a couple dozen people join us. And uh, same with the trivia night in which we. Did multi, we played a almost like a Jeopardy, and we had a lightning round in which the it was related to all the posts we did. So if you paid attention to like our stories and the posts we made, you would like be able to rack up like so many points. Uh, I don't want to brag, but I won on the trivia. Like we were allowed, even the mem the members were allowed to participate as well. So it was uh, really easy. So it was kind of, it's not much to say. I've only been here for like 
a year, but I have to say it's like really an exciting process. So if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'll give everyone like before some time to write their questions in the chat and then you can take those. All right, so we have our first one. What has been your most successful initiative or event to date and how did your chapter organize it? As, let me think. I would say if an event, I, I like to say like the, the trivia because a lot of people were really into it. And I'd say a lot of people actually learned a lot about urban planning because you know we made it so that if you knew the more you knew the easier it was to win so and people a few people decided to like go back on our page you know study a little bit like it was some sort of test or something and that was that was pretty fun all right sounds good so we have another question coming up um <laughs> What is one thing that you would have done had we not been in COVID? Oh, so like I said before, we were planning on renovating this, the school library to make it like, like a, a nicer environment, like easy places, a place better for like people to study. Because right now our libraries uh, can get pretty crowded, um, pre-COVID of course. And then we had like a bunch of people there and usually you would think a library would be like quiet and stuff, but it was, it was chaotic and stuff. So that's why we were planning on like uh, renovating it and stuff. Right, thank you. Um, I'll give everyone a couple more seconds in case there are some extra questions and then we can continue. Actually, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I know you're also a student like me. So what are you most looking forward to in this upcoming school year in terms of just life in general and one up? I have no idea, actually. <laughs> I'm, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not really expecting much. I, I'm just going with it. Like, of course, I'm going to join one up again. It was really fun, but I have no idea what to expect with everything that's going on. Fair enough. I know a lot of students feel the same way. All right. I think we have one more question. Oh, two, actually. Um, what are some ways future school chapters can engage students? And a follow up question. Does your chapter also use TikTok? I'm not sure if our chapter uses TikTok, but I know there are, in many ways, we did some side things, like we, our club did uh, do one thing uh, for like, we sang O Canada and stuff, like for all the posts, like we all like, uh, our president got us, uh, some of us to like, uh, record ourselves singing it, and then she put it all in the clip and then like, what's, some of us doing it in sign language and stuff. So that was pretty cool. Uh, another, a few other things we did were, aside from their educational posts, we also like, um, there was like a lot of like other challenges we did that were based on from our, uh, what you call it? Our student council we participated in. That's about it. I don't know. I don't think we did that much, to be honest. All right. And I think this might be our last question. Has being part of the One Up chapter made you consider going into the urban planning field post secondary? Uh, 
um, me personally, I wouldn't say I was I was planning on going into urban planning because I like uh, so I like working with technology, right? So one of the things I like to do is code. So that's what I was been always wanting to go into. But I I do would say after joining one up, that does seem like a possibility. Not very likely though, but beforehand, I, you, if you asked me the same question, I probably would have been, yeah, no, I, I have no idea what that is. I don't think I want to go into that. But yeah, I know I have a, a friend who would sometimes uh, watch me like uh, do join, like go into the club meetings or like do go into trivia night creating some posts and stuff and he kind of got into it and I, I like to say I inspired him to learn more about urban planning and he he's decided to like go into something like that so if that counts yeah absolutely that's amazing and I think it definitely connects back to Ryan's presentation um I sort of discussed how like underrepresented of a field this is. All right, so thank you so much, Emiliano, for answering all of our questions and for the presentation and sharing your successes with your one-up school chapter. Last but not least, I'd be, like to invite Caitlin from Light, who will talk about leadership skills. So over to you, Caitlin. Oh, perfect. Can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm just gonna share my screen and start presenting. Um, so my talk today is just gonna be describing about how you can discover the best leadership style for you and your team, how you can adapt your leadership style in order to be more congruent with what works best for them and then ultimately create an optimal environment where you can like maximize your team productivity and like ensuring that the work is like meaningful for both you and your team members. Um, so that's, we're gonna delve into that by looking at different leadership styles and how you can adjust your leadership um, depending on the circumstance, and then also how you can effectively manage your team. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Caitlin. I'm an incoming third year at the University of Toronto. I'm studying global health and pathobiology. Um, I've had a plethora of um, experiences in the past five years with leadership. Um, I feel very privileged to have these experiences because I feel like they were very formative and they were able to make me into the person I am today. So it started, you know, from leading school clubs um, to later on becoming the executive director of Light. I'm also currently a steering committee member of the Canadian Council of Young Feminists for the Vote 16 campaign. And I'm also the co-founder of Young Ontarians United, which is a provincial uh, research in initiative. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and my background. So I've had a lot of experience organizing both like large scale events, small scale events, teams for different purposes, that sort of thing. So I've had the opportunity to be able to like explore my leadership and see it evolve over the years in order to also help advise other people on how to um, find their best leadership style. So I guess um, what we're covering today, as I already alluded towards earlier, is um, identifying your leadership style and also how to improve. And then secondly, um, team building and how to really manage your team effectively to maximize your productivity. So I think when we're talking about leadership, it's an important place to start with organizational culture, because I think um, a large goal of leadership not only is the practical, tangible outputs of your of, of your project, like, you know, whatever you want to, like, literally accomplish, but it's also as the director or the leader of a group, you have the responsibility of kind of like setting the tone. And I think this is really important that you are aware of it and be proactive in establishing this. So what is organizational culture? Well, culture refers to basically a shared understanding of values, expectations, or practices. And when applied to like a company or a organization environment, it's just simply like the energy or vibe of your work environment. So that can describe like the level of formality, like whether you guys have like um, a dress code at work. Obviously this is not like, you guys are not, I guess, a company right now per se, um, but these sort of things all contribute to organizational culture, like the mode of communication, the tone of communication, the way you guys relate to each other, um, what is kind of like acceptable or normal within the environment. So obviously given that it is an element of culture, in part, everybody contributes to this because everybody is part of it. Um, but I really would think that it's the 
kind of the onus of the leader to be able to establish this to ensure that it's going in a healthy direction, right? Like if things are going out of hand, the leader is the one that's responsible for kind of regrouping things and making sure that things are going in a um, streamlined direction. So I guess with this in mind, we just want to be proactive in the way that you are establishing your own organizational culture of a club, of a group, or any working environment. This could even be like group work at school. Um, so yeah, so I guess that's something to keep in mind. Um, now moving on to leadership styles and also like why on earth you would kind of think about this sort of thing, because I think it's not covered in school. Like you're never told like, oh, there are different ways to lead a team. And I think the funny thing is, is that there's no correct way either. Some people will think like, oh, like, I must be a certain way or I have to be like more assertive or like more controlling of my team to be able to like ensure that I have authority, ensure that they respect me. But there's really a different, like there's different styles that work for different groups of people. So that's why um, I think the best leaders, I would argue, they adapt their styles to their team to ensure that their team is set up for success and um, is, is a good working environment, right? Um, so leadership styles, by understanding this, it highlights where you can improve, um, also allows you to set appropriate goals in conjunction with your um, focuses and direction. And I also think that it can help you also like in interviews when you're interviewing for new roles, because understanding your own leadership style is part of like understanding your personal brand, what you bring together, bring to the table and like what your strengths are to a team too. Um, so I think that that's why it's important to kind of consider these sort of things. So I'm going to walk us through a few elements of leadership that um, I think are important to kind of decide how you want to be a leader within your um, within your group. Um, and the first one obviously is your strengths. So considering what you're good at um, allows you to understand what you can leverage to be the most effective leader um, from yourself, right? So everybody has different strengths. I listed some of the ones that came to mind when I was brainstorming them. Um, like you could be good at communication. You could be good at conflict resolution. You could be really empathetic. You can be really motivated. You can be very results oriented. These sort of things would set yourself up to be like a sort of different leader, like a sort of different flavor. You know, if you're really results oriented, likely you'll be very like focused on like getting work done, motivating your team members, maximizing the things that you're gonna do, being very ambitious with your goals. If you're more empathetic, you're gonna focus on more ensuring that everybody feels safe and comfortable within the environment, serving others, making sure that they're realizing their potential and actualizing um, happiness on this team, that sort of thing. Um, these are not mutually exclusive by any means. It's just like, by knowing what you're good at, you know that you can shine on your team and really help bring out the best in your team. Um, so conversely, with strengths, you have weaknesses and everybody has weaknesses. And I think it's really important that you're able to identify where you're not as strong at because that's where you're, you'll be able to understand where to improve. Um, so obviously some of these are on the screen and I'm sure probably some people can like very much identify with some of them. Like maybe some of people are like indecisive. Maybe some people procrastinate a little bit. Maybe you have lack of experience and that this is like your first time being a leader of a large group. And that's totally okay because I think that where your weaknesses are is also where your team will come in and compliment you, right? And it's good to know that you're not supposed to just be in charge of everything, just doing everything as a leader because that's unsustainable, right? Like the point of teamwork is that everybody contributes a little bit. If, 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 if the work didn't require that many people on the team, then it would just be assigned to one individual, right? So knowing where you maybe fall short is where your team can help complement your weaknesses. So for example, if you know that you're a little bit indecisive, well then use maybe a more democratic uh, form of decision-making where everybody participates in the decision-making rather than you just like delegating things out. Um, if you're reluctant to try new approaches, well then try being more proactive with innovating new things and maybe asking for suggestions from your team members. Like maybe force yourself like every single meeting to try one suggestion from your team members. Little stuff like that can help you become a more dynamic and flexible leader. Um, so the next one is your motivations. Um, and the motivations are kind of like, what are you motivated by in your team? I kind of talked about this earlier, but like results oriented versus like more people focused. Um, are you motivated by like achievement on your team? Are you motivated by connection building? Uh, what are your goals? Um, are, you, are you trying to maximize the personal growth among your team members? So these sort of things are like have to do with what you value within a team and also like what your deliverables or your target goals are. Um, so these incentives largely dictate like what actions you have to take. Um, and also the deliverables will also like kind of describe what your team has to do because it's like, if you have a really short-term goal, then your team has to work quite harder to get towards it because it's like more immediate rather than if it's like some long-term goal, maybe that might change the way you strategize and you mobilize your team. Um, the next one is decision-making style. 
So this is like how you make decisions. So there's like kind of a continuum of leadership behavior, which I kind of liked on this on this page. I added this little graphic. It basically describes the breakdown of how much decision the leader makes versus the team members. So if the leader is making like all of the decision and literally just announcing it and there's no contributions at all from the team, well, that's like a very like authoritarian approach. And if the um, leader lets the team decide everything with like almost no oversight, that's a very like laissez-faire approach. Um, different uh, decision-making styles work best in different environments. So like, as I note on the screen, it depends on how much you trust your team and the level of experience of your team. If you know that you have much more experience in your team and your team is starting out and they're like less experienced, then it might be a better idea where you come up with something and then you present the idea and then invite questions, sort of like this three, third this third block over here. Or if you really know that they have, if there's like a disparity where maybe you're working with very young children, like you're managing a team of like third graders or something and you're like in university already, well then you might be might think like, okay, you know what, I'm gonna use my oversight in this case and then just make a decision and assign it. Um, versus if you know that your team relatively to you has way more experience, just say you're the project manager, but you, they're, they're going into a realm that you're not as familiar with, then you can like perhaps allow, define the limits. So define what the goals are and then allow them to make the decision. Um, so determining this will allow, to, will allow you to define how much freedom the individuals on your team have and also allows them to feel more ownership of the work. I tend to like to give more freedom for the team because I feel like when you just like tell the team or kind of order them, it, they don't feel like they're as involved with the work. So it kind of like decreases in meaning and decreases in investment for them because they don't feel as part of the work, right? They just feel like they're just like an element that's just doing labor rather than someone who's like co-designing and co-creating, right? So I think that's really important to making members feel like this work is meaningful and it's doing something for them, right? Um, next, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, the element of professionalism and hierarchy. So professionalism is like, do you want a more casual work environment or more formal? Uh, given that this is a lot of youth work, I think I find that youth spaces tend to be more casual um, because you know we usually use social media as our, as our communication channels like Slack or Messenger or even Instagram. Whereas I think sometimes workplace environments more often use like emails exclusively. So I think that's something that you can decide in your team how, like how I guess formal you want it to be. Um, something else that also could be like, how much joking do you want there to be in like the group chat or like um, in meetings? I know that sounds a little bit weird to be thinking about because, but it does make a big difference because if like, there's a difference between an environment where everybody only talks about work-related things in the chat versus one where like people are like sending memes to each other every day, right? Um, so they'll make for very different work environments and there's pros and cons for both because um, I've had environments in both in both natures and when there's a lot of memes in the chat it's a lot of fun but also sometimes it can detract from your actual work so that's something you might want to think about like maybe you'll have a separate account sorry separate chat for your team to be able to send each other fun things but I really do feel like that having that allows you to bond closer with your team and also makes the work more enjoyable for everybody um about hierarchy this is about like kind of your role so this is when you're thinking about your team structure um your, maybe your executive team structure or the way your organization will be formed um, do you want to operate with a more strict hierarchy or a little bit more of an egalitarian approach? So if you think that it's more important that everybody's kind of like decentralized leadership where there's no one sole leader, then you might want to just not define a sole leader. Um, but if you find that it's more helpful to have a defined leader that they can coordinate and kind of liaise with like maybe upper management, then that might be helpful to have um, a, a person designated at the, as the lead, right? Um, and that's where you can come and kind of think about like titles and like the formality of that and how entrenched those are. Um, I find that the balance is definitely needed. Uh, Light has tried both decent, very decentralized leadership styles as well as very um, hierarchical leadership style. Um, I think we're finding that a happy medium is the best because we found that when we did decentralized leadership, um, social loafing kind of occurred where people didn't do as much work because they assumed somebody else was going to do it because there was no kind of clear leader where they're going to delegate out work. So we found that that didn't work as effectively as when we just had at least someone designated as a lead, even though the lead is kind of like on the same level as everybody else. The lead just is the one that is able to delegate out tasks, if that makes sense. Um, and then finally, um, their focus. So the focus has to do with also like the motivations that I mentioned earlier, but this is more specifically just talking about like short-term versus long-term. Um, I find that different leaders tend to fall into different categories depending on the personality. I know that I'm very much like a short-term 
kind of person um, working on thinking more long term because it's important for vision and strategic planning. But I think that depending on your personality, you will naturally tend towards one of these. So it's good to know which one you tend towards. So then you can kind of accommodate and counterbalance that and counteract it. So if you're focused on the short term, obviously that's looking at like the immediate environment. So what's happening in the next month, the next week, next year, approximately the immediate deliverables, your immediate goals. Whereas long term, it's more thinking like, you know, a few years in the future, where do you want your organization to grow? How do you want it to grow? Uh, what do you want to be able to achieve in a few years time? I think both are very important for not only ensuring that you have, you know, solid operations from day to day, but also knowing that you're ensuring the growth of your organization in the long run. Um, so how do we use this? So after you kind of think about all the all these elements of leadership and what you think you would like to do as a leader, um, I think it's important as one application to be able to improve and adapt to your team. So things that you might want to consider are the amount of time available, the level of trust, like as I mentioned, who has the information. Um, that refers to who has like the expertise, like as I mentioned. So if if your team knows more about a specific topic than you do, because they might they might end up knowing more about a specific thing than you do, then maybe you want to allow them to make more of the decision making um, or vice versa. Um, internal conflicts and type of tasks refer to if you know like some members of your team don't work as well together, that might affect the way that you like you know segregate tasks or segregate uh, teamwork. Um, or the type of task to like knowing your team members uh, strengths and weaknesses and your own strengths and weaknesses so that you can effectively delegate tasks. Um, so basically you can use this to identify congruencies with, between your leadership style and your team. Um, so for instance, if you're if you like to be very hands off but your team is like relatively in, in, inexperienced, then you need to maybe need to become more involved to help them out and to support them. Um, usually you can also determine these incongruencies through evaluation. I'm a huge fan of like every month or every few months sending out a survey to your team to see like how they're satisfied with the work um, dynamic and such. So then you can get the feedback from them on like how they think communication is going, how they think team meetings are going, that sort of thing. Um, the second application is meeting facilitation. Um, meetings are kind of an interesting thing because they're basically just a conversation with a bunch of group of people, but they're very structured and unstructured at the same time. So I think based on your focus, whether that's short-term or long-term and your decision-making style, whether you make the decisions entirely, the team makes the decisions entirely, or you guys do a mix, um, it affects how you run meetings, right? Because if you are making the decisions exclusively, then you'll probably just create a team agenda where you just send it out and you're just like, this is what we're gonna talk about, I'm presenting today. Versus if you want them to be making the decisions, it's important that they have the information that they need beforehand to make the decision. So let's just say you guys are deciding like, what day to launch some sort of new campaign, then you should probably give them the information a few days before the meeting so that they can mull on it and that they're not put on the spot in the meeting because then um, that would lead to the best results when they're able to think about it and reflect on it beforehand when you vote on the decisions at the meet actual meeting. Um, so yeah, so just to wrap up, I know I think we're getting close to the end of the talk, um, a little bit on team productivity and how, how to actually effectively manage your team. Um, so a few practical elements come into play when it comes to thinking about productivity. Uh, the first one that I think is a huge one is task delegation. Um, as a leader, sometimes you might have a tendency to just want to do everything because you're just like, look, I know what I'm capable of. I can trust that I'll be able to do it in the time that I'm giving, right? But I think it's really important as a leader to trust your team members um, and to delegate the task so it's more sustainable. Again, like, like I said earlier, you can't do everything, so you shouldn't be trying to like uh, do all the work. So with task delegation, something to consider is do you want to assign it to one person or more than one person? There's pros and cons with either of these. Assigning it to one person means that you can follow up with that one individual and that you know that they'll, um, they know that they have the sole responsibility. So it's less likely that they will procrastinate on it because they don't have somebody else to lean on. Um, the benefit of having more than one person assigned to it means that they can have collaboration, means that they, they can hold each other accountable, but it also means it's more likely to someone to fall through if both parties assume that the other party will be doing it. Um, so that's something that you can think about also depends on your team member style because I know that some people prefer working alone and some people prefer having a partner um, with them to be able to start the work together because it's a little bit daunting to get started. Um, in terms of large teams, I'm not sure how large your team is you're planning on um, having is but if you ever have a large team, you know we're talking like 20 30 people. Um, keeping track of deadlines and responsibilities is huge so I recommend like using spreadsheets or. Uh, task lists so that everybody knows what they're doing because in a meeting when you're like you know del uh, delving off um, um, sorry delegating off tasks 
uh, it's really easy for I think everything like all the information to kind of get muddled together and people to forget like what exactly they're assigned to do versus somebody else. So it's important that you as a leader are able to um, keep that clear. Um, and then finally, the culture. Um, I think it's really important that people feel comfortable dissenting. I, I know that sounds kind of weird because it's like, well, don't you want people to get along into a green group? And yes, you do. But if somebody sees an issue with an idea, you really want to make sure that they feel comfortable and safe enough to speak up about that because otherwise that might manifest into a worse problem down the line, right? And then at that point, it's too late for them to be like, oh, well, I thought this was a problem, but I just didn't want to speak up about it, right? So I think that you should be, you should ensure that you're allowing individuals the space to um, disagree and also allowing them to express when they're unable to meet deadlines. So that's also equally important because if they can't meet a deadline and they're just thinking that, okay, you know what, I, I can't tell my team at lead this because like they'll get really mad at me, then they won't speak up about it. And then the task just won't get done in the end. And then it'll end up delaying the project even further rather than if they spoke up about it, like, you know, a few days prior to the deadline, then you would be able to find someone else to cover for them, right? So I think it's important that you're having these like active conversations with your team so that they know that you're encouraging them to speak up about these things and have really good channels of communication. Um, so yeah, I think, I'm not sure if we have time. So basically the last thing I wanted to talk about was team building and the importance of really having important, like strong team bonds. Um, an, an exercise that I always like doing with any team, whether that's a group project or a large team, et cetera, is um, three questions. We ask everybody to list their top three values, um, anything that they find is a pet peeve and one, two goals for the year, one professional, one personal. And the reason for this is the values shows us what's important to others, which I think is really nice because it sets like a positive vibe from, vibe from the beginning because you know like what everybody thinks is important and what you can kind of hold them accountable for. Like for me, I always say that uh, empathy and compassion is really important as well as integrity. So that, you know, down the line, if people know that that's important to me, that they, they know that they can know that I will probably try to ask from that. And if, you know, I'm acting incongruent with that, they can remind me like, Caitlin, you're not being very empathetic right now. And they know that that's something important to me, right? Um, the pet peeves, this one's just kind of like a fun one to do because I think it's really fun to hear what it kind of makes your team members tick and also prevents you from like annoying them. Um, Cause I had a team member that their, their um, pet peeve was when people would come into the room and not close the door. And in like in the meeting alone, I realized I had already done that twice before, before hearing that that was something that annoyed them. Right. Um, so that's something that's um, kind of a fun one. And then the goals, I think in any team it's important to support each other in their personal and professional goals. So, and it also allows you to be a little bit more vulnerable and comfortable with each other, like sharing like something that you're trying to improve, right? Because I think it's always a honorable thing to be trying to improve yourself. So it's good to share that and also to be able to support each other and keep each other accountable in that way. Um, so yeah, I think that summarizes everything that I wanted to share. Um, obviously I could talk for hours about leadership and team management, but um, this is like in a nutshell, everything that you can do to best set yourself up for success in leading your team in the upcoming year. So I'd love to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you guys so much for listening. Should I stop sharing? Um, sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Caitlin. I'm just gonna, same as always, give everyone like a couple of minutes to get all of their questions out in the chat and we'll see where it goes. Um, I myself actually have a question um, while we're waiting on the other ones in the chat, actually. So um, you talked a lot about leadership in your presentation, and I think that relates a lot to our school chapters, which is what we're trying to build in Leaders Lab, the confidence and the skills to run your own school chapter. So um, based on your knowledge of leadership, how can a school chapter organize themselves so that everyone on the team gets leadership opportunities? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, great question. I think that naturally within a team, um, I like to kind of dismantle the, the myth that only the individual, I guess, that's at, at the head of or the lead of the group can be a leader, because I think that there's ways of showing leadership, 
even when you're not that individual. Um, there's such, like, I think you, you show leadership when you show initiative, when you, you know, step in to help one of your team members, when you come up with a great new idea, when you, you know, perform your tasks, like, really, really effectively or really excellently, and you do a good job of them. I think all of those things are, like, forms of leadership that are just maybe aren't as seen as much. So I think that anybody can do those, no matter what role that they have within the team. Um, but with regard to creating opportunities for other individuals um, within a school chapter, I think what I really liked um, seeing is that back when I was in high school, what we would do is like, obviously, I, I, I'm assuming that school chapters operate with like, you know, some sort of like exec team that kind of help run the uh, organization or the, the group. And then, you know, there's members. What they would do is that they would organize, you know, quite a few of the events or quite a few of the outings, but they would offer like every other one that you know, a member would be able to step up and do it with their help, with their mentorship. So I remember when I was in grade, grade nine, they asked me if I wanted to help organize because it was for debate club, basically, um, not one up Toronto, but um, they wanted, they wanted um, me to be able to try like collecting money, getting everybody's uh, forms in so that we can register for a tournament. And that was really formative because then the following year, when I became an executive, I was able to do it with no problem because I had already gotten um, experience and also with the mentor direct mentorship and support of the executives so I think maybe by offering just opportunities for maybe non-executive to collaborate with the executives in coordinating projects or initiatives I think that could be really helpful in building and offering those experiences absolutely thank you so much um, I think we have another question in the chat what are some of your tips for conflict resolution within teams uh, um, I, have, I, I, love, I love talking about conflict resolution because I don't think it's talked about enough. I think, um, uh, I'm trying to think about like little tips because I, I usually have like this entire like procedure that you're supposed to go through when it comes to conflict resolution basically. Um, I think the first one is if you have members that are upset at each other, right? I think it's important that you act with empathy and compassion and you don't take sides for it, first of all, because if you take sides, then it just makes the other party not, not feel like validated or heard. And you also have to remember what each party wants to get out of it, right? Because clearly if there's some sort of disagreement, there's something, there's an incongruency where either party isn't feeling like they're getting enough of something, right? So it could be either that both parties has an idea that they think is really great, but you can only implement one of them. So therefore, when they're disagreeing, they feel like the other is like invalidating their, their idea. It could be because both parties maybe want a specific role that they're both competing for. It could be because both parties have like a difference in value systems. So I think that when it comes to that, you have to identify what the root uh, disagreement is. And also just remember that both sides aren't trying to hurt the other side, hopefully. Um, if there really is someone being antagonistic, then I think that's time where you have to speak to that individual and be like, hey, this is problematic. That isn't what we expect on our team. Um, and we expect like, you know, kind of the values that you established at the beginning of the year, depending on like what you, uh, what you, what you discuss. Like for me, kindness and empathy is always like at the top of the list. So like all my team members know that that's usually expected on the team. So like, you don't have to always agree, but you always have to treat each other with uh, kindness and respect. So if they're not doing that, then that's like, clearly not following what we've established as our agreed upon values, right? Um, so if it, as long as nobody's being like acutely antagonistic, then it's usually probably some sort of disagreement or something like that. I feel like mediating a conversation between both parties and ensuring that both parties know that, you know, the other isn't trying to hurt them and that it's safe to express their ideas and you want to hear their ideas is really important in validating both sides. Um, so without getting into it too much, I think one, make sure that you don't take sides, two, make sure that you mediate conversations in a safe environment. So maybe wait until the fire kind of dies down and like maybe wait a day or so, let everybody kind of think about it, sleep on it. And then three, um, make sure that both parties feel heard and validated and that you know that you're valuing their contribution and you're just trying to seek the most um, amenable and most agreeable solution. So that sort of, I think that's what I would say. Not no worries. Um, for the slides. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I just wanted to ask you if you were comfortable with us sharing your slides. Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'd be happy to send them over to one up Toronto and then maybe that, that way they can be distributed. I'm not sure. Yes, absolutely. So after Leaders Lab, we'll be sure to distribute those slides to everyone who wants to access them. Okay, that's brilliant. All right. And we have one last question. So what are some ways to build cultural competence and awareness as both a leader and a role player? Hmm, that's really interesting. 
I think um, in my experience, it's just like greater exposure and also just talking about it. Um, I think that I, I haven't I come and encountered too many like cultural incongruencies where there's like a very dyadic understanding of what like teamwork should look like. Because I do understand that there are differences across cultures, but I think just uh, working in the GTA, even with different individuals, like working with like even individuals who are newcomers, I think there's still like some foundational shared understandings of like what teamwork should look like. Um, I think in terms of like the, maybe the smaller, like minor kind of uh, expressions or aspects, it's just about talking about it. So I think hearing from other individuals, what is normal in their culture or what they um, think should be normal is uh, really important. It's kind of like what I mentioned in a team building, um, you can add that in. If that's something that you know that your team might have heterogeneous experiences, you can say like, oh, what is something that from your culture that you would really want to share with everybody? And then everybody can share one thing from their culture. And then it'd be really great to, you know, share these like cross-cultural experiences. Because I think working in the GTA, most individuals will be in the GTA. So that's already a commonality, but everybody also has different backgrounds. So then it's kind of interesting to see where you have similarities and where you have differences. And it's just always remembering to maintain the respect um, um, the respect to everybody, no matter what their like beliefs are or their differences are, is really important. Um, so I think that that's what I would say to that. Hopefully that answers the question. Yep, I think that does answer our question. Okay, so I believe that our that's all the questions we had in the chat. Thank you again, Caitlin, for teaching us how to strengthen our leadership skills, and yeah, we'll continue with our leaders lab presentation. Thank All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm sure you all agree that we've listened to some amazing presentation topics today, but this is only day one. So tomorrow's One Up Leaders Lab session is just as jam packed with exciting speakers and topics that will be focused on skill building. Our first speakers tomorrow are Hira, Carmen, and Lily from Kids Speaks Canada. We're excited to have three members from their team present on public speaking skills. Next, we have Christina from Chipotle, who will present on effective marketing tools and techniques. And our final speakers for tomorrow will be Isra and Tammy from an organization called Bite Size. Fun fact, Isra is a former one-up school chapter leader. She and Tammy will speak about the design thinking process, which is a core part of the one-up program. And lastly, before we end off for the day, I just wanted to offer one quick reminder to join the one-up Discord server. In the server, we have exclusive urban planning events and a space for you to ask questions to experts even after one of Leaders Lab ends. The link will be posted in the Zoom chat shortly. I would also like to remind everyone that they should expect to receive an email at 8 a.m. tomorrow with the day two Zoom link that will be different from today's. The Zoom link will be posted as well in the one of Discord. And I just want to say thank you everyone for attending our first day of Leaders Lab. I hope that you've learned a lot of today about the world of planning, the one of school chapter experience in real life and leadership. I hope everyone has a great day and I'll see you all tomorrow.